evolution. She is deeply involved in establishing the chronology of Paleolithic sites in Israel and elsewhere. She is now spending a sabbatical leave at the Institute of Geography and Environmental Sciences at the University of Haifa. So uh, Nomi, we're very pleased to host you virtually, and I hope that soon we will host you personally at the department. Thank you. The podium is yours. I thought you said um, Beverly is going to say something. Uh, yeah, but she's okay. She's reconnecting, so we'll try again. She, so, should she I was, start? Uh, let me check. Beverly, do you want to say something? I just introduced Nomi before because you were. Okay, do you want to say something? Yes or no? <laughs> okay, no problem. <laughs> Go ahead, Nomi. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I'll just say, um, I apologize, I had a c connection problem. I um, want to say good luck to everyone with the semester. Thank you so much, Naomi, for, for opening up the year for us. And uh, we're looking forward to your talk, and it's really good to see you. And um, I just hope that everyone is uh, excited about this year, as strange as it is. And we're all doing something historical, so let's, let's see how it goes. <laughs> Hi, there we go. Thank you. Okay, so I hope everybody can see the screen that I'm sharing. Um, and I'm going to talk about extended range luminescence dating applied to Paleolithic sites in Israel. Okay, so the optically stimulated luminescence dating, or OSL as we all know it, has completely revo revolutionized the study of the quaternary, particularly the middle and the late quaternary. It's used in dating a huge range of sediments from loess, dunes, coastal, fluvial, and alluvial sediments, lacustrine, everything, uh, to sediments associated with haz hazards such as earthquakes, floods, uh, tsunamis, and rock falls. It's applied to uh, ubiquitous quartz grains. Quartz is everywhere, so it's, um, it, it is really applicable in many situations. But we know that the OSL is limited in its time range to 100 to 200,000 years. So how do we extend the reliability of the luminescence uh, methods to older sediments? And that's gonna be a uh, part of my talk. Uh, and I call it the quest to date the entire quaternary because it's a big quest. We don't have many useful methods in, the cont in continental sediments. And luminescence dating and other uh, those related uh, dating methods had a huge impact also on prehistoric archaeology. And since the mid 80s, uh, dosimetric methods are part of prehistoric research and it also rev revolutionized the field. So this thermal luminescence of burnt flint, OSL, and infrared uh, stimulated luminescence, uh, IRSL of sediments, ESR, ESR of tooth enamel, and ESR of sediments. And it allowed dating beyond radio, radiocarbon or beyond very specific and uncommon materials, such as uh, pure calcites, spiliotems, flowstones, or volcanic rocks and deposits. Almost every site in Israel was dated by one or more of these methods, and the list is very long and I'm not going to go through it. Some of you know the sites, other less. And here's just a map of a low, just the lower Paleolithic sites in Israel, and I think it's not even complete. And I'll talk about dating some of them, of the less, uh, actually the less well-known ones. And the outline of the, of the talk will be principles of luminescence dating, limits of OSL, extended range quartz TTOSL, extended range feldspar high temperature IRSL, and application to prehistoric sites in Israel. So let's start with the principles of luminescence dating, and I'll talk about OSL, but it's actually relevant to uh, all the other luminescence uh, signals. So we have a, this is a, this is time, the x-axis, and this is luminescence signal. And we have a, say, a quartz grain sitting in some sandstone or some granite, and the luminescence signal starts growing from the beginning, and it grows until it is, until we, it cannot grow anymore in a situation that we call a saturation. I'll talk about it a little bit more. And then something happened and this grain is exposed to sunlight and the luminescence signal that has, has accumulated since the beginning is reset or bleached or zeroed very, very rapidly in, in a very short time. And I'll talk about that in a minute. 
And this is carried out uh, during the transport by air, by water, and exposure to, to the sunlight. And after burial, again, say in a sand dune or in an oncological site, this quartz grain starts accumulating the signal again and it grows until at this point in time where we take it into the lab without exposing it to the sunlight and measuring the signal. So this is the luminescence signal that we measure in the lab. The reason the signal grows is because of the radioactivity from the environment. And uh, I'll, talk it, I'll explain more about it. And to obtain the age, we need two, two numbers. One is the equivalent dose, which is how much dose, how much radiation created uh, this signal. And the other number is the dose rate, how much radioactivity we have in the environment, uh, which means at what rate the signal grows. Because with high radioactivity, the signal is going to grow fast. Low radioactivity, the signal is going to grow slowly. So I'm going to start with uh, talking about the equivalent dose, the upper side of the equation. And we use a protocol that's called single aliquot regenerative dose, and I'll explain each one of these uh, terms. Uh, we, first, we use, um, this is an aliquot or a, yeah, a subsample. And uh, in this case, this is a 10, 10 millimeter aluminum disc. And here it has in the middle of it a, a few hundred quartz grains in the range of 100 uh, micron. So this is an aliquot, and this is how, uh, what we measure. And for each sample, we measure many such aliquots. And here is the, the luminescence reader, how we measure the signal. So here, are, here is this aliquot sitting with the quartz grains, and there's a hot plate. I'll talk about the heating in a minute. And we can either shine blue light on it for quartz or shine infrared on it uh, for feldspars. The light that the sample emits, which is the luminescent signal, is measured by the PM tube. And uh, this uh, creates uh, the signal. And here we have filters which prevent the light from the stimulation, from the blue LED or red LED, IR LED, from entering the photomultiplier. So only the light emitted by the quartz grains is measured. So this is a single aliquot. And what's a regenerative dose protocol? It is shown here. So we take this uh, natural aliquot, a sample that has not been uh, exposed to sunlight, and we, we preheat it, we heat it to a certain temperature, and then we measure, we measure the signal. We turn on these blue LEDs, and what we get is this luminescence uh, signal. And then we do something that's called normalization. We give uh, the sample a small beta dose. They usually the readers, the TL OSL readers, have a beta source. We, get it, we give it a small uh, beta dose, we preheat it, and then we measure the signal. And this signal is used to normalize the first signal. Okay, so, this, so now we have the natural signal, which is normalized. Then we uh, give it a better dose. In this case, it's 10 gray. This is what it says on the, on the oops, um, here. And again, we preheat it and we measure the signal and we do the same kind of normalization that we did here. And then we give it another dose. In this case, 30 gray, we preheat and we measure. So here's another signal and we normalize it. So we take the ratios of these two signals and these two signals and we plot them as a function of those. So you see it here. So here is the 10 gray and the ratio between this signal and that signal in, in purple or lilac. And here is this uh, uh, signal, the ratio of these two signals. We gave it 30 grays and we put a line through we fit a line through these points and it goes to the zero. And this is called a dose response curve. How the sample responds to laboratory dose. And on this dose response curve, we interpolate the natural signal, this orange part of the, of the sequence. It's plotted on this dose response curve and we go here and we get 22 gray. So we can say that this signal that we measured in the lab was formed uh, by 22 gray of natural, um, natural dose, and we call it the equivalent dose. And this is, this is a SAR protocol, so we have single aliquot, regenerative dose, it's called regenerative because we regenerate the signal, and as I said, we measure many aliquots for each sample, and we use the average. 
Now to the lower side of the equation, the dose rate, environmental dose rate. So here's just a cartoon showing a, a soil profile or a sand profile, a depth, and this uh, little square is blown up here when you see the quartz grains and the feldspar grains. And we have um, uh, the gamma, do the cosmic dose, and the radioactivity is the sum of all the natural radioactivity from the decay of the uranium, thorium, and potassium in the sediment, and from the cosmic radiation that comes from the cosmos. Uh, it can be measured in the field or in the lab, or by measuring the chemical uh, elements, and we have, we get uh, each one of these elements uh, emits either or alpha, beta, and gamma particles, each with a different penetration range. So we have a micron for the alpha range, millimeter for the beta range, and some tens of centimeters for the gamma range, and the cosmic uh, can penetrate to a few meters. So we need to know the burial depth so we can cal calculate the contribution of the cosmic dose. We need to know moisture content because it uh, absorbs uh, the gamma dose. And these radioactive elements, uranium, thorium, potassium, they uh, reside in feldspars, mostly in feldspars, heavy minerals, and clays. So the more we have of these uh, minerals, the higher is going to be the dose rate. So just, uh, just so we understand what we're talking about, some uh, typical dose rates for sediments in, in sandy sand, sandy soil, which are rich in quartz, like in the Israeli coastal plain, or carbon, carbonate rich deposits, highly cemented uh, sands. The dose rate is low because it's very few of these feldspars or heavy minerals or clays. And it's between 0.8 and 1.1 uh, gray per thousand years. It can be even lower. But this is kind of an average. When you go to soils and loess, they have more uh, clays, they have more heavy minerals. It goes up from one gray to two and a half gray uh, of, uh, per thousand years. Granite is rich in heavy minerals, it's rich in feldspar, so it has a higher dose rate, other plutonic rocks, three to five gray. And in Israel, the rock with the highest dose rate is phosphate, because, just because it's rich in uranium. So it can be very high, three to seven uh, gray per thousand years. Right, so what is the signal that uh, we measure in quartz? The source of the OSL signal comes, um, quartz is SiO, SiO2, and this is a, a scheme of the crystal lattice of quartz. And usually we have SI, which is connected to four, we sit in, do, in, in a single uh, dimension, but think of it in, in two dimensions, think of it in three dimensions. Each silicon is connected to four oxygens, and on average it has two oxygens, and that's an ideal crystal. But there are a lot of what you call defects in the crystal. So for example, instead of a, a silicon, we have aluminum. And since aluminum is, has a charge of minus three instead of minus four, we need to balance it. So there's a sodium here that balances it, uh, or lithium can, can balance it. Germanium is four, so it doesn't need balancing. Sometimes the oxygen bond is broken, sometimes there's an oxygen missing, and so on and so on. So each one of these defects create uh, a trap for electrons, which can stay there for a long time. So the electrons can be trapped in these defects, and this is the model. And if we look at the energy-wise, if we look at the energy that is needed to keep these electrons in place, we have all kinds of traps. Each trap has its own energy depth. This is a scale of energy. So some traps are shallow, some are deeper, and we're interested in these two traps, which are responsive to light. And then you have even these uh, deeper traps. Um, and when, when it, each trap will be emptied, so the electrons will be uh, discharged at different temperatures or stimulation wavelength. wavelength. So, so if we hit a sample, first the 110 picos is gonna be emptied and then the 230 and then the O cell traps and so on and so on. And these will be emptied only at very high temperatures, but we can also empty the traps with say light and different wavelengths will empty different traps. traps. So the, the electrons that are emitted from the optically active traps are a, combined with a combination center and emit a photon. And these photons are detected by, by the photo multiplier, and this is the signal that we measure. Uh, and the deeper the traps, the more stable are, they are over geological time scale. Right. So what is the limit, uh, limit of OSL? The limit is saturation. We have these traps, one trap. 
that is uh, filled over time. And after some time, there are no more uh, traps, no more uh, uh, dislocations, no more vacancies, and the signal stops growing. This is a signal intensity against those, against radiation. It starts growing very nicely, and then it stops growing, and we call this saturation. So how far back in time can we go with this OSL signal? Um, and the onset of saturation is defined by a number that's called D naught that we get it from the fit to this, uh, um, the fit of this curve. And the rule of thumb is that uh, the dose response curve can be useful up to twice this uh, D zero. This D zero, you can D naught, you can imagine it as when the dose response curve stops growing linearly and starts curving. So this is just a visual way to look at it. Um, and typical values of this D naught is between 40 and 100 gray. So in Israel, uh, this D naught is 70 gray and it's been uh, measured on many samples and published by uh, uh, Gala Ferstein, my former uh, PhD student. So if it's 70 gray, the two D naught in Israel will be in the, in the quartz typical in Israel will be up to about 150 gray. And that is the limit of getting reliable ages. Anything beyond it is, will be underestimated. So what kind of ages can we get with 150 grays? It will depend on the, on the dose rate. So in the coastal plain where the dose rate is low, like maybe one gray or even less than one gray per thousand years, we can date 150 to 200,000 years with a reasonably good reliability. But for example, in Chinese LERS, which has higher dose rate, it's up to 70,000 years. So that's the limit of OSL. And beyond that, we get increasing age underestimation. Uh, how can we test if a sample is saturated how, or how can we understand the saturation at all? Uh, in 2012, Chapot et al. published uh, the concept of natural dose response curve to check when in, in nature, when does, when does the signal stop growing? And it was tested in a, one of the thick loss sections in China, it's called, in a place called Luochuan. And the advantage of such a section is that it's uniform sediment with known dose rate. So the dose rate is uniform throughout the section. The signal will grow uh, over a, a, in a uniform rate. Also constant sedimentation rate. The, stratigra the stratigraphic ages are known from soils. They can correlate soils to interglacials and they represent a long time. So uh, they plotted the natural signal from a set of this, from this section of LERS against uh, the expected uh, equivalent dose, expected dose. And they know the expected dose because they know the age and they know the dose rate. And you can see that the natural signal in the sample as you go down the section, this is age, but also this is down the section, older samples. At first, the natural signal grows and then at about less than 500 gray, it stops growing. So also in nature, the, um, the signal stops growing, the OSL signal stops growing. And then they took all, uh, all these samples and gave them laboratory doses. So they took this uh, sample, gave it additional doses in the lab and looked how the, how the sample behaves. And you see this is, this is the natural dose response curve, the curve that we see here. And these are the laboratory dose response curves. And you can see that laboratory does not mimic nature very well. And in the laboratory, the signal keeps on growing, even though we know that the sample is saturated. So we have to be very careful uh, of any sample beyond 150 gray, because even if the signal can grow in the lab, it doesn't mean that we're not getting an, an underestimated age. Right, and in Israel, a, a similar experiment in LERS uh, section uh, in Ruhama and in Kerem Shalom Sands in the Negev was carried out by, uh, by Gala. Fairstein. Both sections are thick and there is a sequence of palosols in each and magnetic reversal at the base of the section. We don't have such good age control like in the Chinese list, but we know that these uh, sections were deposited over a long time because uh, they have many pale paleosols in them. So here is very similar to what we saw before. This is the natural signal, the intensity of the natural signal as a function of depth. Here is in Ruhama the LERS and these are the sands. And you can see that the OSL signal in Ruhama stops growing at about two or three meters. And in Kerem Shalom, it may be four meters, four and a half, if you want to be optimistic. It keeps, well, maybe even three. It's hard to say. 
And the difference between uh, Ruhama and Kerem Shalom, why there is a difference in the depth is because Ruhama is less, the dose rate is higher, and the saturation will occur earlier. So we see that, uh, that this saturation uh, is found everywhere in nature, and signal, the signal does not grow forever. Um, another aspect I want to talk about is the bleaching of the luminescent signal. I'll show you an experiment. Uh, bleaching, I, it's an experiment of bleaching of quartz and felt bars for two natural samples from southern Israel. And what we did is we took a sample, a prepared aliquots, and put them in the sun for different times, and then measured the luminescent signal. So this is quartz, um, quartz, IR, quartz RSL. And you can see that the quartz RSL is reduced to 10%. This is 10% of the original signal in something like two or three seconds, very, very fast. This is the feldspar, and we measured the IRSL at 50 degrees. And it re it's reduced to 10%, a little bit slower. Um, we, can't see it, uh, we can't see it on this graph, but you can see it here. And it's reduced to about between 50 and 80 seconds. It, redu it is reduced to 10% of the natural original natural signal. But what's interesting that the feldspar, even after 10 minutes of bleaching, still has some residual signal, whereas the quartz oil cell is bleached to essentially zero. So different minerals have different properties. And I just must say that in nature, bleaching is not so efficient as in the lab, because we don't have grains placed on, a, on an aliquot and placed and put in the sun. Uh, these sediment low, the grains can be coated with uh, um, carbonates, with clays, with iron oxides, and the time of uh, transport can be short. This is just a reminder. Right, so let's go back to the quest of extended uh, range dating. We're looking for a signal that grows with time, does not saturate rapidly, bleaches relatively fast, it is stable over geological time scale, can be used uh, using the SAR protocol, and I'm saying this just out of convenience, it's a very convenient protocol, and can be recovered in the lab, I'll not go into this last uh, requirement. And I'll talk about the thermally transferred uh, or TT or cell of quartz, and the post-infrared infrared, infrared uh, signal of alkali feldspar measured at elevated temperatures. I will not talk about other um, extended range methods like quartz supergrains, single grain TTR cell, and violet stimulated luminescence. There's just no, no time for all of that, but you can see it in the literature. So let's start with the TTOSL, the thermally transferred optically stimulated luminescence. I will not repeat this whole acronym, you'll just say TTOSL. And it's measured like that. After we measure the OSL signal for a long time and depleted completely by the blue diodes, the sample is heated again. And this uh, second heating moves a uh, charge electrons from deeper traps into the OSL trap. And it looks like that. Um, here is the experiment. Here is the original OSL signal. And note that this is a log scale. And uh, so we measure the OSL signal for uh, 200 seconds, and then we preheat it at 260 for 10 seconds, and suddenly we have a new signal. A new signal shows up, and we measure it again, and here you can see, uh, you can see it, um, the signal on its own. And this signal is very, usually very, very weak, about one thousandth of the OSL signal. And if we go back to the diagram I showed you before, the OSL uh, uh, trap comes from this, uh, the OSL signal comes from this trap, and we, apparently we have movement of charge from this trap, which is not light sensitive or is deeper, into this um, OSL trap, and here we see it here. Over the last uh, 10 years, it's been studied quite extensively, and what have we learned about it? It's a natural dosimeter, it's sensitive to radiation, it can be measured using, using uh, different types of SAR protocols, in the lab, it grows almost linearly up to 20,000 grays. So this is really amazing. 20,000 grays, you can date up to 20 million years. Uh, you know, it's really almost verging on ridiculous. So when this was published, it raised very high hopes. This is just a comparison between the OSL signal that we know saturates early and the TTO signal, which just grows and grows and grows. Um, and other experiments show that uh, it can be recovered, meaning a, a known laboratory dose can be measured up to a thousand grays, and I'll not go into it right now. 
Right. Um, so in experiments, it bleaches very slowly. That's one of the major drawbacks. And here, is, here are two experiments, one done in a solar simulator. So it's a lamp that uh, simulates, that simulates uh, the sunlight, and this is over seven days. And the, the second one, this experiment was done in the sun, and it's over almost 14 days. But uh, it's more or less equivalent time, because think of uh, the sample outside in the sun that during the, uh, during the night, it's not bleached. So it's more or less equivalent. And you can see that uh, even after such long bleaching, you have between 10 and 15% uh, of the signal remaining. But if we, we look at modern samples, for example, this is a dune sample from the negative that we measured TTOSL, the OSLDE is, is nothing. And the TTOSLDE is four gray. And four gray is, not, is really very, very low compared to the very high DE values that we want to measure. So in nature, this signal can be bleached. And we know that uh, TTOSL ages gave uh, pretty good agreements uh, with other methods. So this is a compilation by Arnold et al. in 2015, and it took all the available TTOSL ages, which have some sort of independent age control, either by uh, other luminescence methods or ESR or uranium lead and so on and so on. And you can see that there's a pretty good uh, agreement between the TTOSL ages and the other, uh, the age control, up to about uh, a million year, million years. So that's very reassuring. And, but if we go back to the, our golden candle <clears throat> of how far back we can go in time, and we go back to the sections in Ruhama and Kerem Shalom, we can see that the TTO cell signal in Ruhama stops growing at about five meters, four or five meters, and in Kerem Shalom, um, maybe six meters. So it definitely does not grow to 20,000 grays. And, our, and, and this limits our time range. Another thing that uh, uh, Freshstein et al. showed is that if you plot all the, da all the samples from, from um, in this case, Ruham and Kerem Shalom, uh, you can see that the equivalent doses don't go beyond 600 gray. Doesn't matter how old the sample is. And it, it is similar behavior when we take all the samples that were measured by TTOSL uh, in Israel from all throughout the country. And you see that we don't get equivalent doses beyond 600 grays, no matter how old the sample is. And this is explained, explained um, by a ther but that the signal is thermally unstable, which means that we have some signal loss. As the traps start filling out, some of the, some of the electrons are lost naturally. So this limits how, what kind of equivalent doses we can get. And this loss of signal is proportional mainly to environmental temperature and age. So the older the sample, the higher the temperature, the more loss of signal we have. Right, so to summarize, the drawbacks of the TTOSL signal is poor and incomplete bleaching and, and it's thermally unstable. And also, although it grows in the lab to fantastic values, the highest uh, natural DE value we get in the lab, we, we see in the literature, is 1,370. Most are less than 900 gray, and it, it varies from place to place. And also, not all samples have TTOSL signal. This is a sample from, uh, from China, and I've seen it from samples from Brazil and elsewhere. This is a natural signal and we cannot regenerate a natural signal. We measure the natural signal, and then the TTOSL cell signal does not grow. Uh, and we need to check always the, the thermal stability, but nonetheless, it is very promising for old sites. Now, it's been, it has been shown by Adamia et al. in 2010 that the signal loss due to thermal instability can be corrected for. If you know the temperature and you know the dose rate, it can be done. And I'll just say, show you an example. Uh, it's, not an it's not an archaeological example. It's a geological uh, uh, study done by uh, Uri Rib and was published in 2012, where we dated um, carbonate-rich uh, alluvial fans and calcretes from landslides in the, in the west of the Judea mountains. And here you see the corrected age, corrected for thermal instability, and this is the original age. So the, the ages, the correction increases the age by 10 to 20%. So here we get an age of close to a million years. 
And here on this, this alluvial, uh, these, these terraces, we get ages of uh, 590 and 690,000 years. So pretty old. And the reason we can get such old ages is because these are very carbonate rich and the dose weight for these samples is very, very low. 0.4 to 0.6 uh, gray per thousand years. Right, let's go to the second uh, extended range signal that we want uh, to talk about. And it is a um, uh, feldspar. And it's been used for dating uh, since the beginning of luminescence uh, dating. And it was traditionally measured at uh, 50 degrees. It's a very bright signal when you compare it to OSL, many tens of thousands of counts. It bleaches quite well. We saw in the, in the previous experiments, not as well as OSL, but not bad. Single aliquot protocols were developed over the years. It saturates at pretty high doses. You can see here is a dose response curve and it goes and it doesn't seem to saturate and the signal is bright. And it was used extensively for dating um, loose polymineral fine grains in the past. Uh, it, because the feldspars have also um, potassium inside the crystal, we need to take that into account and the dose rate is a little bit higher than quartz. But we have a problem with the fading of the signal. And IRSL50 signal measured at 50 degrees usually suffers from what we call anomalous fading, loss of signal over time. And the ages are severely underestimated when compared to quartz from the same sample uh, or to radiocarbon. And over the years, several methods were devised for measuring this fading and correcting for it. And I'll not go into how you measure it. And it's described in percent per decade and values which are lower than one to one and a half percent are considered negligible. But when you measure the fading for the IR50, it's usually pretty high, three to five percent. I've seen also values of seven percent. So these corrections can increase the age the age by, 10 to, by 20 to 30 percent. <coughs> um, so in, the, in 2008, a new approach was proposed for measuring IRSN with this group of researchers from Riesel, Denmark. And the idea is like that. After we measure the IRSN 50 degrees, we deplete the signal. We measure the signal again at higher temperature. So in a way, it's similar to TTOSN. You deplete one signal and then you measure the other one. And they call it, they call the, this uh, signal post IRIR or in short PIRIR. And this TTT is the measurement temperature and it was first suggested to be quite high, 290 degrees. And when you measure fading for this signal, it hardly fades and you can see it grows very nicely and the signal is even brighter. This is the IR50 and this is the IR290 measured uh, for the same sample and you can see the signal is very, very bright. So what are the properties? First of all, it's hard to bleach, not as hard as the TTOSL. It's reduced to 10% in three hours. TTOSL, remember, it took several days to reduce it to 10% and it has some residual. And here you can see bleaching experiments. Uh, this is log, log scale. So this is the quartz OSL and you can see it bleaches really, really rapidly. And this is the post IR, IR at 290 degrees. So like two orders of mag magnitude slower bleaching than quartz or cell. Uh, so other studies used a lower temperatures for measurement, not 290, but 270, 250 different people use different temperatures and tested which temperature has the least fading and best bleaching. So it's a kind of a trade off between easy uh, bleach and the amount of fading. The signal saturates at very high doses doesn't matter at what temperature you measure it. And the D values of over 1000 grays have been reported. So the state of art is you need to select the optimal temperature. It can measure reliably up to 100 gray. It does not uh, fade at least the one at 290 degrees. You have to be worried about poor bleaching. And again, we look at uh, the comparison of a uh, post IRIR uh, ages with other age control and here, it doesn't matter, but it, it has here a different measurement temperature. So it's a little bit of comparing apples to oranges, but still there's a pretty good agreement between independent age and the post IRIR ages. Uh, right, so to summarize uh, these signals, I'm just showing the two D naught of different signals for the same sample from Spain. And these are the different dose response curves of the different signals. So for OSL, for that particular sample, it's 225 gray. 
For post IR at 290, it's 830 gray, and for TTOSL, it's 920 gray, which means that for, for this TTOSL, for 920 gray, for quartz samples with low dose rate, we can uh, measure samples up to a million years. And feldspars, because of the higher dose rate, up to 500,000 years. Okay, let's go uh, now to prehistory. Well, I've talked for a long time. And I'll first show a site which is not so old, just as a proof of concept where we tested different uh, signals on the same samples. And we, we, we chose a site which is not too old so we can rely on the OSL, OSL edges for a veri verification. So the site is called Athlete Railway Bridge Site, or Athlete for short. It's located on the coastal plain, very close to some of the well-known cave sites uh, in the Carmel Mountain. And here is a section, you note it's 220 meters of the Aeolianites, which are exposed along this road. And the section was dated some years ago uh, by Frechen and, uh, and colleagues by IRSL at, at, at 50 degrees and uh, multiple aliquot protocol. And these are the ages that they got, so like 150,000 years for the base of the section and then the ages get younger towards the top. What you see here is one unit down here. Here's a kind of Palo beach cliff. And then this unit was deposited here and everything was covered with another unit. And there are caves, three caves, one, two, and the third one is here, that developed inside this uh, Aeolianite, which is carbonate rich. And these uh, caves have been filled with sediments and a uh, be uh, Aeolian sediments like beach, beach rock that contain hearths, uh, artifacts, and faunal remains. And these are the focus, the focus of this dating. And if we look at it uh, um, in the field, this, this is like the cave and it is completely filled up. You can see the top of the cave and the sediments. And we took uh, two samples uh, from the archaeological finds. And this is a second cave and here it's a little bit less filled up. And here is another sample. Um, the samples are highly indurated, very difficult to sample. We had to use a hammer and chisel and take blocks to the lab and then clean them up there. So, and you can see here is some of the finds from the, from the site, a uh, Mousterian artifacts, uh, bones of a uh, tortoise, gazelle, deer, and shells which might have been perforated uh, to make uh, necklaces. So we used many different techniques on that site. We did also a SAR on quartz. And this, this is like our uh, candle. This is, we think is reliable. Uh, SAR is another protocol which can verify all kinds of parameters. I will not get into it. Violet stimulated luminescent SAR on quartz, just for proof of concept. Post IR, IR290, which is um, one of the uh, signals I'm talking about. And we measured also IR cell 50 and we corrected it for fading. We measured the fading. And here are some of the signals and the dose response curve and the distribution of aliquots. And here are the results. So each uh, signal, this is age, age scale, and each uh, signal is for the three samples. One, uh, two, and four um, are marked with a different color, and the average is shown in orange with the error bars. And you can see that the, first of all, the ages agree quite well with the different methods. And you see that the IR50 corrected for fading, these blue ones are a little bit lower. I don't know if we didn't measure the fading correctly or we didn't do the correction properly. Um, but anyway, this is the, what we got. And if we average all the techniques and minerals, for one sample, we get 87,000, for the second sample, 91,000, and for the third sample, 71,000. So it puts us in marine, uh, marine uh, isotope stage five A or B to early, the very beginning of marine isotopic stage four. At at least part of that uh, time, the sea was not very far away. Like uh, on, for five A, sea level was, was only 20 meters uh, lower. So it agrees with the finding of uh, aeolianites and beach rocks. And the site is contemporane contemporaneous with the nearby Taboon Cave and other sites. Now this site is not a, like, it's not a big deposit and lots of uh, finds. It's like people came, sat there for one or two days and then went back. So you can imagine that people from the Carmel Caves visited the coast and used uh, that spot for, to shelter for a few days and uh, exploited the marine resources and other resources. 
Okay, so now let's go to the more heavier stuff and more difficult to date uh, sites. Um, application of TTOSL and post IRR to all older lower, paleo, paleo, lower paleolithic sites. And I'm going to talk about three sites. Nachal Chesi, Kfar Menachem West, and Revadim, that are shown here on the map. Here is Tel Aviv, the coastal plain. Uh, at least that I talked about is much further to the north. Jerusalem is about here. So all these uh, sites reside in what we call the inner coastal plain, on coastal Aeolian, Aeolian sediments, uh, sands, paleosols, uh, calcarinites. Let's start with uh, Chesi, which is the most so southern one. It was uh, excavated in the 1970s and recently it was surveyed and trenches dug to understand the extent of the site, the stratigraphy and geomorphology. And this is a map showing, this is the stream, Nachal Shikma. It doesn't have running water all year, you know, this painting it in blue is a little bit of an illusion, but it's a stream. Here is the archeological uh, excavation from the 1970s, and these are the trenches that were dug. And all these are, are finds that were found in the survey in the area, flakes and flake tools, cores and core tools. And here's what one of the trenches looks like. Um, reddish, brownish, uh, sandy sediments. So we took five uh, samples of luminescence dating from the archaeological layer that was exposed in the trenches. Here is some of the hand axes found uh, in, the, in the trenches. And quartz was measured by OSL and by TTOSL, and alkali feldspar was measured by post IR290. And the OSL is mostly saturated, as you expect for such old site with Australian industry. But there is a good agreement between the two other signals, the TTOSL and the post IR290. And here are the section from the two trenches, three trenches. So let's start with this one. This one has younger sediment. The top is a kind of a loss, and you gave us 7,000 7, years. And slightly deeper, we got 156,000 uh, by OSL, so it's not very old. But the samples from the archaeological layers are uh, reasonably old. Here we took two samples and we measured two samples with two signals. So we had four ages and we averaged them. They were all very similar, 430,000 uh, years. And in the second trench, trench, we got even an older age, 550,000 years. And the DE of the TTOSL is still within the acceptable range. It doesn't go beyond 400, 450 gray. So we think the ages are acceptable, especially the good agreement with the post IRIR. And so the age range of the site is 550 to 430,000 years. And what they see in the trench is repeated cycles of infill and down cutting, probably resulting from the proximity to the stream. And this places, the ages places the site in the middle part of the lower Paleolithic. Uh, the second site, Kfar Menachem, mm -hmm. it's a little bit north of the previous site, situated in a very similar geological uh, position excavated in uh, 2005, additional uh, trenches dug um, in 2011-12 to further understand the site. Uh, this is Highway 6, and um, this is the, the 2005 excavation, and here are the trenches. There was a quarry here, and that's where they found a lot of the artifacts. Some of the artifacts are shown here. Panomagnetic measurements show that unit one, which underlies the archaeological layer, is magnetically reversed. So this raised the concern that the site is too old for dating. But we took samples anyway from uh, three samples from, the, from one of the trenches, from, unit, from a unit that overlies the archaeological layers, and we extracted quartz for OSL and TTOSL. And a lot of other sedimentological analysis were carried out, and you can see them uh, uh, in this paper. So here is a, this is the excavation, and you can see the darker unit on the top and the more red, reddish uh, soil at the bottom. Um, and here is the trench, and you see the darker unit on the top and the more reddish units at the bottom. And here is a section from the two trenches, and you can see um, that here is the normal, normal and reverse uh, transition. So here it's older than 780,000. The artifacts are here, more or less, or in, and in this unit. Sorry, they are here in the contact. Um, again, the ages, I'll just put the ages here. I put them so you can see them. Um, so this is greater than 780,000. The two uh, TTOSL ages are, um, were corrected 
for thermal instability. So they're around 450,000 for this unit, and the top sample was much younger. So there's an unconformity here, but there's also an unconformity here between the magnetically reverse or close to magnetically reverse sediment and the archaeological layer. So the age of the site is older than 450,000 years, and again, it's, it's similar to Nachal Chesi, both geologically and in age. Right, and the last site I'll talk about is the Revadim Quarry. These ages have not been published, uh, most of them. So it's the first time I'm showing them. And it's a quarry uh, that was used for sand uh, for construction, very nice uh, quartz on sand. And it was first excavated in 1966-1967. And they found a very, very large site. It's very rich Australian industry an amazing fauna, like uh, elephant tusks and elephant pelvis. Um, and at the time, I, I sampled extensively for luminescence dating, extracted feldspars, because that's what we did in the late 1990s, and used the, the IR50 signal. Here you can see the, the excavation part of it. Actually, it's a second excavation, but that shows you the site. Here's the quarry and the sand. And the first uh, excavation was published uh, by Marder et al. in 1999 with two IRSL 50 ages. And even at that time, we acknowledged that these could be minimum ages. You know, the rumors about fading were already circulating and we knew that IR50 is not so reliable. And then there was additional excavation in 2004, which was published in 2011, which revealed very complex geomorphic processes. And since then, many other studies were carried out, for example, on animal residue and tools, on lithics recycling and more. And if you put uh, Revadim in any of your favorite uh, academic site, you'll find the papers. So here's a photograph of the section. And here is a, a, a drawn section. And what you can see is the Gromosole a vertisol at the top, and then there's a gray brown soil, uh, which we call here brown quartz or soil. And here you can see very uh, not undulating contact between the husmas, which is a kind of hama soil, rich in carbonates. You can see it here. And this, we've, we have always interpreted this as an unconformity between the soil, the red soil, and the gray soil. The artifacts are concentrated more or less at this contact, a little bit below, embedded in the ready soil and a little bit above. Um, and both Hama soils were found to be magnetically normal. So we don't have any reverse in this section. So here I'm showing the IRSL edges that I measured in the late 1990s using a multiple aliquot protocol. SAR was not invented yet. And here are some of the finds from the side, beautiful hand axes. So above the conformity, I got ages uh, of about 200 to 300,000 years, below around 400,000, and then it goes down. And I had an age from the base of the section, which was about 500,000 years. The dose rate was very, very low, very pure quartz. So even with the uh, methods at that time, uh, we could get such old ages. So, but recently with the development of the new extended range dating, I took back, uh, took out the samples from storage, we extracted quartz from the same samples for TTOSL, and we took the feldspars, which were in my storage, and measured uh, post -IR, the post ir protocols at varying temperatures. First, I want to show a comparison between the TTOSL ages and the post ir at 290 degrees for five samples from the uh, Revadim. And there's a really, really nice correlation, which makes me, of course, very happy when you get two methods, which are a little bit different in the dose weight and in the signal and all kinds of assumption, and they come out to be the same. It's very, makes you happy. So here's, here are the new ages. And I'll, I'll show you in a minute the blow up of this section, which is of interest. But I just want to show you the entire section and the sample from the base of the section let me just go through the, the symbols. So the green triangle is TTOSL, the, the, the reddish uh, square is post IR measured at 250, and the post IR at 290 is the blue diamond. And actually I'm interested in, to show you the diamonds and the triangles. So here we, the bottom, at the bottom of the section, we get ages, which are more than a million years old for the both TTOSL and the 290 signal. The 250 signal is the, gives a much lower, 
uh, DE, so I can, uh, much lower edge, so I consider it less uh, reliable. And it's because of the low dose rate that we can get uh, such a uh, high ages. So here is a blow up of the, the top of the section, the top like half meter above the unconformity and half meter below. Um, and here is the time scale. And because of all kinds of issues that are related to dose weights, I did not sample very close to the, to the unconformity or, or the contact between the units. And this zero shows the contact between the gray soil on top and the red soil below. Um, so the, the ages have quite a bit of a range here and here, but overall it looks like, a, uh, well, as I said, the post IR290 is more reliable. And you can see uh, there's a cluster of ages here and here they sort of become older, except for this one. Not uh, the best set of samples, but it still gives us some sort of uh, idea how old the site is. And we have other chronological data. As I mentioned, the Hama soils are magnetically normal. So even the, the Hama in, in which the artifacts are embedded is younger than 780,000. And in Marder, uh, when he published his paper, he wrote there that preliminary dating of carbonate coating of flint artifacts using the uranium thorium methods yielded ages between 300,000 and 500,000 and possibly older. So these are carbonate coating which are deposited on the artifacts after they are uh, the, covered by soil. So the ages are younger than the artifacts, but also the sediment is younger than the artifacts. Okay, so if we summarize the quarry, the edge of the archaeological layer three, the red soil, is between 450 and 600,000 years from the luminescence ages. And it, go, it, looks, it looks very, very comparable to the uranium thorium age. And the overlying layer two is dated to 250 to 400,000 years. And actually the unconformity between the units is less obvious now when we have more ages by more methods. We need to look at, look at it uh, carefully. And the sand at the base of the quarry could be as old as one million years, maybe even more. Um, okay, so summary of methods of the IRSL 290 and the post in the TTOSL. So TTOSL D values of up to 500 gray are reliable and provide reliable ages. The post IR 290D values up to at least 1000 gray can be measured with accuracy. And sites along the coastal plain can be routinely dated up to at least 500,000 years due to the low dose weight. To increase reliability, it is advisable, of course, to measure more than one mineral and or technique. And here I'm just showing just a, a nice uh, plot from a, a recent paper by uh, Gala Fairstein from uh, who used to be my PhD student about dating a uh, Kerem Shalom section. And here she used many different signals and many different protocols and all kinds of corrections for fading. And this is a, a section that goes back uh, down to about 60 meters. And it was dated to uh, the beginning of the uh, middle, uh, middle Pleistocene. And actually Gala is gonna give a talk about uh, this section in a few weeks at the geological service, so you're all invited. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nomi. It was uh, uh, a wonderful talk. Uh, really appreciate. I think we all are really appreciate. Um, I open the podium for anybody that wants to um, ask a question, rather by speaking or rather by uh, writing in the chat. Okay. I have a question. <laughs> Can you hear me? Sure. Yeah. Hi, Naomi. Hi. Hi. Um, I had a question. I I, uh, I I didn't notice if you mentioned this, but in the the cave site at Atlit that you talked about in the beginning, that were dates from around um, there, had OSL dates from about twenty five to fifty. Is that right? Ninety thousand. 90,000. The, the shell that you showed there, um, yeah. was that also dated? I mean, it's kind of beyond radiocarbon ages, but did they do a comparison with the shell in the same context? Uh, no, and I'll tell you why privately. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, it, was not, it didn't work. It didn't work. Let's say it didn't work. Okay. And, uh, All right. We didn't. No. It's a possibility. 
Yeah, yeah, I'm just surprised. I, I, I don't know how common it is to find that in such early, that species in such early sites. But. Well, they have found perforated shells in their earlier sites even. Oh yeah, no, perforated for sure, but I'm wondering which oh, species. The Maybe we'll talk about it later. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I think Ravital wants to ask something. Yeah, I, I want to ask about the bleaching of the sediment and, uh, and how, how water influence uh, bleaching. For example, if you have sediments that are underwater in a, in a lake or in a wetland, it's probably different from sediments that are on the surface on land. Is, is, do you have any, um, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, water really absorbs light very fast. And even in very clear water at 10 meters depth, um, there's no blue light. The blue light is, and the UV is the best uh, bleacher. So, and there have been experiments done in the past. People put uh, sediments at different water depths in, in, I think in the sea, not in lakes. And they show how slowly, it, it does bleach, but very, very slowly with, uh, with water depth. Okay. So it's not a very efficient mechanism. I, if you're thinking of sediment deposited at the bottom of the seabed here in the, you know, the, our sea shelf, I think bleaching is carried out before it is... Uh, before it enters the... Before it yeah. enters the system and maybe when it's just at the surface. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's very, very inefficient. Okay. Um, more questions somebody has? Yeah, Itzik. Hey, Nomi, how are you? Hi, Itzik. Um, <clears throat> something that I, I don't understand is, is, is a very basic uh, question that I, I fail to understand. In your model, the, the samples are exposed, and then the reset is uh, it's exposed, and then it's covered. But uh, in your model, it's covered instantaneously. The question is, the, in reality, it takes time to accumulate, and, and you showed already that the radiation affects to meters, may affect to, to meters uh, depths. How do you account for the burial time of the, of the sample? So there are two issues, and one of them, if I understand it correctly, is does it continue bleaching while it is being covered? Mm -hmm. And the answer is after about two millimeters of cover, there's no more bleaching, even with the purest quartz sand. So the shielding from light is very, is almost instantaneous compared to the time scale that we are trying to date. But regarding the dose rate coming from the cosmic uh, rays, we do have to take into account uh, the accumulation of the sediment. And if the we can either assume that the accumulation is relatively instantaneous compared to the age of the sediment or that it's gradual. And we have to take that into account when we calculate the dose rate from the cosmic dose. Yeah, we need to know um, the history of sedimentation. It's important. Okay. Um, okay, yes, I see. Miriam, welcome, by the way. Hi, Mira. <laughs> Since I work with Revadim and the uranium thorium ages were performed by us, uh, what I have, an, uh, you, you mentioned the range of ages. Is the range of ages that you get and I get are associated with the real age of the artifact or with your methodology and my methodology? You mean that we're dating, we're dating um, different events. You're, you're dating the, you were dating the carbonate cover that was deposited on top of the tools and I don't know how long it takes to get such kind of cover, but, but you know that uh, for even in archeological sites, uh, historical sites, you get such a cover on the artifacts. So it can be relatively rapid. And I'm dating the sediment that is deposited after the people left uh, the site and left their stuff uh, around. So it's a little bit difficult to, to say exactly who is more close to the actual use of the site. Okay. But I'll, I'll be happy to talk to you because I could not find, I remember you once gave me the, the ages for this uh, cal, uh, calcite deposit and I could not find it. So I found uh, just a very, very rough range in uh, Ophel's paper, but uh, 
Yeah, we can talk about it. It's going to depend on the location, so it's okay. much more complicated, but uh, I wanted to ask just this question. Okay. 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 I don't see, of course, all the people. So if somebody else wants uh, to ask, please write in the chat, I want to ask or something, um, considering the current situation. <laughs> I don't see anybody else. Um, well, okay. I want to thank you very much, um, Nomi, for uh, giving us this wonderful talk. Um, so I'm sure that uh, our students have learned a lot about um, OSL dating from you. Um, and that's it. So uh, thank you very much. Yeah. I want to say also thank you to all the people. Thank you for inviting me. And also thank you for all the people from all over the world and my colleagues from Brazil that have showed up to this talk. Thank you for getting up early in the morning and joining us. It was very nice to see you around. Yeah, I wanted to say I wanted to say that we have people from the United States watching, from Brazil, uh, from Europe, and those that I recognize, but, um, and many from Israel, of course, from several parts of Israel. So I'm very happy we got at actually to 61 participants, which is pretty good. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Physically, no, I would not. You get more people when you talk online. You can't help. <laughs> It is one, yeah. of, the, one of the few advantages. Yeah. And also to all those international uh, uh, visitors, right, people are watching right now, there are quite a few um, scholarships, postdocs, and things in our department. So if you have up and coming PhD students that might consider coming to Israel to do their postdocs, uh, get in touch with us. That was my ad. <laughs> right. Great. Okay, thank you everybody for having attending and I'm looking okay. forward for the next week. Thank you. Everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you.